Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so welcome to the first talk in the New Directions in American Speaker Series. I'm Manu Vimosheri, and I teach in American Studies here at Barnard. Um, and so, you know, I had these notes that I was I was going to remember what I was supposed to say, but I, for, I lost my notes. Um, so the New Directions in American Studies Speaker Series is a joint project between the Barnard Program in American Studies and the Columbia Master's Program in American Studies. Right? So we're working together to bring speakers to campus. This is the first of our talks, as I said. Um, and uh, this talk is also co-sponsored by the Barnard Center for Research on Women and uh, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies here at Barnard. So today's talk is uh, Trevor Ellison is here to teach us about black trans reproductive Great to see so many of you here. There's plenty of space in the middle aisle if anyone is okay sitting on the floor um, instead of coming to the floor. I think that's what I had prepared. Okay, great. <laughs> so if you're wondering why there's three of us here introducing uh, the event, um, I'm uh, Professor Christina Henderson along with Manu and George Camp. Um, we're uh, professors in American Studies, and this is the first event in something we're calling uh, New Directions. I do have a piece of paper and I am going to read uh, from it, but I just want to give you all a sense of what we mean when we say New Directions in American Studies. Uh, we see New Directions in American Studies as a site of sustained collaborative research and study. We take as our point of departure a state Malcolm X made here at Barnard College on February 18, 1965, three days before he was assassinated. This is what he said, quote, I am a human being first and an American second. Our work is rooted in a commitment to internationalism, to black liberation, anti-imperialism, radical feminist and queer critiques, decolonization, radical labor movement, historical materialism, and critique of political economy. We take our location in Harlem seriously as a central historic node of the global south. We link our intellectual work, teaching, and dialogues to Harlem's ongoing history of freedom struggles. And we situate ourselves in American studies, a field where anti-racist feminist principles accountability to radical social movements, and a commitment to redistributive justice are inextricably linked from intellectual production. Um, we uh, oversee a number of activities. We host uh, visiting scholars. For example, we just hosted um, Nick Estes, who was a, a native scholar activist who was very um, active in Standing Rock. We organized a, a speaker series. This is the first of our speaker series events, and we're so glad you could all be here. Uh, we do manuscript workshops, and we also organize major um, uh, conferences. So in uh, fall 2018, we'll be organizing a big global radicalism conference that I hope you'll be hearing a lot about. Each of these activities is directly linked to seminars and lectures. Uh, I want you all who are thinking about classes for the spring, uh, to know that um, next semester, Manu will be teaching Introduction to American Studies. Jordan will be teaching a seminar called Incarcerating the Crisis based on his book. And I'll be teaching a course called Global Radicalism in preparation for that conference. So that's what I have to say. But Can I jump in? Ahead. Our class is not Introduction to American Studies. That's a, that's a right wing Cold War class. But my class is What is American Studies? <laughs> 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 All right. Like I said, I'm new here. Good evening, how's everyone doing? It's great. Uh, my name is Jordan Camp. I also teach American Studies here. I should say I'm also teaching a course on, called Critical Approaches to Ethnicity and Race that I will be teaching today in the spring as well. Yes. I'm delighted to welcome my friend and colleague, uh, Trevor Ellison. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to introduce Trevor as the first speaker in this series. Um, let me just say, I've had the good fortune we've decided to be in dialogue with Trevor since 2010. And um, that's when Trevor moved to Southern California from the University of Illinois, Urbana, where Trevor earned an MA in geography to, and went to USC to pursue a PhD in American Studies and Ethnicity. And we've had these sustained dialogues over the last seven years because Trevor is a committed activist, a radical intellectual, a prison abolitionist, a scholar of trans and queer historiography, carceral geographies, and social movements in the US. And Trevor also happens to be an assistant professor at 
Dartmouth College of Geography, Women's, Gender, and Sexuality <coughs> Studies, and was also a postdoc postdoctoral fellow there. In those fields, their work has appeared for in journals such as Transgender Studies Quarterly, Feminist Wire, C Magazine, and Bard's uh, Feminist Scholar and Feminist Online. Trevor has also worked with a range of social movement organizations, including uh, as a political education coordinator for Critical Resistance, a board member of Dignity and Power Now, both of those in Los Angeles, and as a researcher with the Youth Justice Coalition in Los Angeles. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. okay? When we were envisioning our first speaker for this New Directions in American Studies initiative, um, Trevor quickly came to the top of our list because what we want to do is foreground the kind of accountability to social movements, um, to historical materialism, and to a critique of racial capitalism. And the reason Trevor came to the top of this to talk about these topics is because of the work Trevor does in the struggle to end racial capitalism, stop police violence, and abolish prison industrial complexes. It's kind of minor goals here. <laughs> <laughs> and as students in the American Studies Seminar with Manu and I know, uh, these commitments have led to fruitful and impressive collaborations with groups like I just mentioned, the Youth Justice Coalition. The um, Scholar and Feminist Online published this work, Mapping Police Violence in Los Angeles. And it was really important for us to study because of the work that you all did in a moment of massive uprisings from Ferguson to Baltimore to LA and beyond in confronting racist state violence that targeted young black and brown people marked for premature death to engage directly with them to intervene in this um, crisis. Trevor's currently uh, working on a manuscript it's entitled Flex Zones, which traces the articulation of queer and trans criminality in relationship to the racialization of space and historicizes queer activism and ag advocacy and its shifting relationship to the carceral state from 1970 to 1990. This afternoon, Trevor will be discussing black trans reproductive labor. So without further ado, please join in welcoming to Hi. Oh, wow. Um, well, thank you, uh, Christina and Jordan and Manu for such a warm and lovely introduction and for this invitation. I'm really excited slash high key nervous to be here. I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm excited to give this talk. This is something new I've been working on, you know, like every, when you finish grad school, you have to think about how, how you're gonna like deal with your dissertation and turn it into a book. And so I'm thinking that this will be the first chapter. So yeah, this is something new. It's still coming together. So I appreciate your generous listening. All right. Okay, so there are a couple of concerns that are animating this thinking. And try first, I want to say at the outset, this term black trans reproductive labor, it's experimental. I'm like less interested in defending the term and more interested in like the questions that come out of trying to put these words together and think about their relationship to each other. Okay. And so there are a couple concerns that are animating this thinking. First is the way that uh, transgender visibility, representation, and legal and political recognition seems inextricable from the elaboration of status and extra legal violence, abuse, criminalization, and killing of trans people, particularly non-white trans and gender non-conforming people. I call this the visibility paradox narrative, and I'm concerned with the way this very narrative often assumes that visibility, violence, and criminalization, especially of black, queer, and trans people, is linearly progressive and has reached a historical apotheosis. I'm concerned about the extent to which this narrative naturalizes the killability and abjection of black trans people and black people in general. And part of this thinking is trying to say, what if we thought about visibility and criminalization of, and in general, the production of black trans subjects as sinusoidal, iterative, and related to social, cultural, political, and economic crises rather than kind of something that is linearly progressive. Uh, the second concern I have is what I'm calling, I'm bracketing as uh, feminist biopolitics or the shoring up of positionality 
around racialized cisgender womanhood and a, a very like biological understanding of that. Uh, the term cisgender is, is used uh, often by queer and trans activists to call attention to the entanglements of consent and coercion that belies categorical power. Yes, gender is imposed on everyone uh, in, in many ways. One of those is through the assignation of a kind of binaristic sex and through the kind of proliferation of idealized gender roles and identities that map onto a, a binaristic continuum. However, some people receive power and pleasure by actively identifying with the gender identity or role that is most in, in most social accordance with the sex one is assigned at birth. Cisgender was meant to call attention to that, to call attention to the power of being named and naming in regards to gender and sex. But instead, cisgender has become doubled down upon as a position from which to assert feminist and sometimes feminists of color biopolitics that hinge on the cis women's unique position in relation to reproductive labor and capital um, that's drawn primarily or solely from her anatomical differences from the trans woman. Um, yeah, and so we see this kind of feminist biopolitical narrative coming from a range of scholars and intellectuals and public figures from people like Liz Gross to Chimamanda, Chimamanda Adichie uh, feminist biopolitics is related to what people are calling trans-exclusionary radical feminism and that they both rest on a very rigid understanding of the relationship between biological sex, the body, and reproductive labor. I'm concerned that this position tends to reify and naturalize the very workings of power that feminist scholarship has tended towards denaturalizing and that it abstracts the ways that criminalizing gender nonconformity has been instrumental to upholding a gendered and racialized division of labor and organization of space. Um, Silvia Federici like reminds us so beautiful and beautifully in Caliban and the Witch that transformations in racial capital require the unmaking and remaking of social relations, reshifting the meaning of social reproduction, trying to control and organize women's reproductive capacity to facilitate the kinds of spatial arrangements and social relationships that for her were key in the shift from feudalism to capitalism. But then trying to bring that insight into the present, Rod Ferguson, who's looking more in a more contemporary time period, like in the like uh, World War II and post-World War II era, he reminds us that transformation in, in capital also kind of require and depend on the multiplication of racialized discourses of gender and sexuality. So trying to name and theorize something called black trans uh, reproductive labor is about thinking critically about such multiplying discourses and geographies and how those get scripted into the social relations of racial capitalism which I would argue reaches its most deadly and value producing instantiations when being and knowledge is organized around race as a generative and fungible socio-spatial imaginary. Several questions emerge for me from this thinking. One, how does taking a longer view of trans subjects under the kind of gaze of gender conformity, so trying to understand the production of what today we would call trans subjects outside of the kind of temporality that those terms were very active um, or had reached a certain level of social sedimentation, how does doing that challenge canonical narratives of transgender subject formation? How do the spatial politics of anti-blackness challenge understandings of reproductive labor, and how does gender function as a key strategy of elaborating racialized space and racism? And the archive I will share with you today, uh, just kind of outlining where I'm moving towards the answers to those three questions, we'll see that one, taking a longer view of gender conformity in the 20th century, taking a longer view of gender conformity in the 20th century, we could see that black what we would today call black trans subjects, but we're not called that then, we're called a variety, like we're called a variety of other things. Um, female impersonators, sexual inverts, sometimes homosexuals <coughs> or gay, so like things are a little bit more open. Um, you know, that comes into, like that black, um, sorry, what we today would understand as black trans and queer subjects come into archival view at the nexus of the articulation of the carceral state and urban geopolitics. It is the racialization of space that forms the capacity of police to discover and an anxious media to report on racialized gender nonconformity. 
However, even these archival glimpses gesture towards the ways that black gender nonconforming women and femmes formed economic networks and undercommons similar to what LaShawn Harris documents in Sex Workers, Psychics, and Number Runners, which is a great book, you should read it. <laughs> um, the prevailing politics of anti-black racism entwined sex work, domestic work, and intimate labor for black women, cis, trans, and otherwise in pre and post World War II Los Angeles and post um, challenging the ways that feminist scholars have delineated, parsed, and struggled over the concept of reproductive labor with terms like intimate versus affective versus precarious versus survival labor. Finally, we see in this archive that gender, or more aptly put to quote Hortense Spillers, ungendering functions as a method of elaborating racism and as a tactic of reproducing racialized space, but also as a way of crafting racial progress and kind of delineating the bounds of racial, of ethnic and racial communities. In this way, I depart with Spillers and those who argue that gender is strategic and uh, relegated to producing or the com producing or cohering the domestic. Instead, we see in this time period that the archive spans roughly 1950 to 1970, that the politics of gender as a mutable category about the interaction between people and environment is, quotations, snapping into place. And this is something I'm thinking through in dialogue with uh, Paul Preciado and Testo Junkie, who argues that gender is like a Cold War formation, and Kyla Schuler, whose new book, The Biopolitics of Feeling, is gonna come out soon, which is also gonna be really good, um, as a method of elaborating racist tactics of spatial management, as well as kind of uh, helping to reproduce a white spatial imaginary that is also very concerned with reproducing a gender division of labor. To deal with these questions for me has meant to try to approach black trans geographies and subjects as sites of spatial knowledge and sites of knowledge about ruptures in US culture and racial capitalism following Grace Hong, Catherine McKittrick, and Clyde Woods' work. Through the course of my dissertation research, I found several archival fragments about black gender nonconforming people in the course of trying to understand how, crimin how queer criminality was being articulated articulated in post-war Los Angeles. The archive itself is a place that renders black people and blackness ungeographic. The three stories I encountered, I found in three different archives. One in the, the, uh, the stories that I'm gonna share with you, I found fragmented across several different places. One was in the LA Public Library newspaper archives, the other, the Los Angeles City Archives and Records Center, and then the one National Gay and Lesbian Archive. LGBT history books about Los Angeles tend to lament the absence of archival material on black people in black places and treat what places they do encounter as entries in a kind of expanding roster. This is perhaps why some of the best work on black LGBT history in Los Angeles has been done by ethnographers and people using oral history, people like Kai Green, Alice Hahn, and Mignon Moore. This talk is an attempt to piece these fragments together to think about how they constitute a black sense of place following Catherine McKittrick and Clyde Woods who write it, a black sense of place, brings, in, brings into focus the ways in which racial violences, concrete and epistemic actions and structural patterns intended to harm, kill, or coerce a particular grouping people shape but do not wholly define black worlds. McKittrick writes further, with this in mind, a black sense of place can be understood as the process of materially and imaginatively situating historical and contemporary struggles against practices of domination with the difficult entanglements of racial encounter. Trying to think of these stories not as instances, but as a position from which to think, a position of thought, a position that preserves a sense of place, is my attempt to disrupt how the structure and purview of post-World War II lesbian and gay archives render non-white, trans, and queer subjects as always already belated arrivals to the archive and to the projects of subjectivity, rights, and knowledge production. I try to weave a black geography from these archival fragments um, and from an archive, yeah, I, I think you get it. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> The first story is of three black gender non-conforming domestic workers who were outed as gender non-conforming after being racially <coughs> profiled by an LAPD officer in the middle class Wilshire district of Los Angeles in January 1950. Um, this photo is from a news article uh, that I found at the Los Angeles Public Library newspaper like microfilm collection. 
and uh, it was published by the Los Angeles Her Herald Examiner. Uh, the article says that LAPD officer R.E. Brown spotted three young black women exiting the restroom of a theater in the affluent Wilshire district. Officer Brown reported that he was looking for female purse snatchers and that these three women caught the officer's eye, even after they explained to officers that they were employed as domestic workers in a home nearby. Officers proceeded to arrest the three for what remains from the traces of the archive, no apparent cause, because they said they were looking for pickpockets and the article doesn't stop that, stops talking about it right after that, right? Um, and so once, the, once these three people were brought to the Wilshire police station, the arresting officer discovered that Tisha, 19, Mary, 21, and Rita, 21, uh, the names that the young people gave to the police were not exactly who officers expected them to be. And the article goes on to say, quote, togged out in fancy feminine attire, including dainty underclothes, falsies, high heels, lipstick, and powder, three young housekeepers were unmasked today um, following an examination at the Wilshire police station. The Herald Examiner interview uh, goes on uh, to talk about how they interviewed the employers of these three young people who expressed quote, utter shock at learning that their employees were not what today we would understand as cisgender women. Um, approaching the case of Tisha, Mary, and Rita as a location from which to glimpse black trans reproductive labor fo focuses our attention on several things. First, this story highlights that interest in gender nonconformity in, in general is not new. The Herald Examiner in particular published stories like these frequently beginning in the late 30s in order to organize particular class and political interests around moral panics about white family life. This story in particular functions to legitimate policing and especially policing in the Wilshire district which um, has and still has a large mix of commercial and residential space and has long since been uh, what someone like Kevin Mumford would call an interzone, uh, kind of meeting like uh, the neighborhood itself has been a place that has traditionally had a lot of different kind of different neighborhoods that are differentiated by uh, race and ethnicity. So unmasking gender nonconforming femmes in general was a strategy to suture the LAPD's transition into a war on crime from a previous war on labor. And criminalizing black gender nonconforming people spoke to fears of maintaining racially segregated housing markets, um, given that racially restricted covenants had just been outlawed a few years earlier in Shelley versus Kramer in 1948. The Herald Examiner published the government names of these three younger people, which was also common and done as a disciplinary tactic to make sure that people would lose their job um, and be publicly shunned. Uh, so what was striking to me about this was that all three people, like, all, like if you look at the government names, that I'm not gonna like repeat their government names because I don't wanna like further the unmasking of the state, but the names that they gave, the gov like their official state recognized government names, they all have different surnames, but the names that they gave their employer, like they all have the same surname. And so I thought this was really striking to, is like pointing to the ways that these three people, um, you know, at least to their employers, presented themselves as a group of sisters and possibly used that as a means of gaining and sustaining employment. Um, and that also, it kind of points to, as much as we could maybe try to recoup this as a kind of necropolitical archive, it also points to the fact that people like created like economic networks of support to navigate what was already a hostile labor environment to black people in general. And we know that domestic work was one of the few jobs where there was like a low barrier of entry for black people in Los Angeles. Um, so, I think one thing that this kind of emphasizes is that black gender nonconforming femmes were subject to the kind to similar precariousness that circumscribed black women's labor under what uh, my friend and colleague David Stein likes to call racial Keynesianism. Um, the lack of formal protection for domestic workers meant that these uh, black young gender nonconforming people, like many other black workers, had to form networks of support to navigate a hostile and racist labor market. I can't help wonder how, but wonder how these three people knew or met each other, if their employers were lying when they expressed utter shock, quote, utter shock, <laughs> at learning that they were not like natural born women, born women, and then what it means that there's no way of knowing that, and what it means that the figure, and, and yeah, what it means that all this work is being done by, 
around the, like the figure of the black invert. Um, and this brought me to Sarah, ha Sarah Haley's work because Sarah Haley reminds us that the kind of, um, the figure of the black invert is really important in, the, in what she calls, to what she calls Jim Crow modernity. And that, uh, you know, studying black, a part of knowledge production around the black invert was like studying black women in prison. And she's writing about prisons, I believe in the state of Georgia, yeah. And so she, uh, I think this is just a good reminder that uh, queerness is sutured over time through representations and discovery uh, that suture gender and sexual nonconformity to blackness. Uh, Sarah Haley writes, quote, the meaning of queerness was constructed through carceral renderings of excessive, uncontrollable, and often naked black bodies. And I think that brings into resolution just the whole, the whole process of ungendering in this scene, the fact that it took a strip search to kind of like, pro you know, produce this scene of discovery. Um, and she further says, the proliferation of the association between blackness and queerness constituted one of the critical terrains upon which not uh, knowledge about gender and sexual deviance was constructed in the years preceding its circulation to describe sexual counter-normativity. So what she's saying is this work in the scene of the carceral of like affixing a certain kind of gender and sexual deviance to blackness is already kind of like prepping, um, what is she saying? Yeah, it's like, uh, it's kind of preparing, it's preparing it's kind of preparing for a more like socially sedimented, like uh, instantiated form of what she calls like sexual counter normativity. Or so what we will come in the mid fifties to understand as like the homophile or like gay and lesbian identity, gay, lesbian and trans identities. Um, it is unclear what these three young people were. I think it's also striking that it, was, it is very unclear what these three people were arrested for. The arresting officers claimed to be looking for purse snatchers, but then the article was titled, quote, nabbed in maid masquerade, and implies that, uh, the ish that what they were being charged with was masquerading or dressing as the opposite gender, which was illegal at the time in Los Angeles. Um, in fact, just a year before, in 1939, the then reform mayor, Fletcher Bowren, had tried to pass a municipal law that would ban women in city who worked for the city from wearing pants to work. So this, func this story then functioned to suture anxieties about a shifting sexual division of labor after World War II. The figure of the black invert space invader casually using the restroom in an affluent commercial area works to authorize policing as a public good and, leg and legitimate the usefulness of stop and frisk style racial profiling and strip searching as a means of producing safety. Um, police chief, William Parker, uh, it's also notable that in this year that the story was published, 1950, police chief William Parker began his 16 year tenure as the chief of the LAPD. Um, and Parker heavily relied on the figure of the sexual criminal and sexual deviance as a means of further, uh, further elaborating the racist tactics that the LAPD had refined in their war on racialized labor in a, pre in a previous time period. And so, uh, upon Parker's appointment as chief, he declared, quote, with all fiber of my being, I will see to it that cr the crooked rats who could change the city of angels to the city of Diablos will not do so, end quote. And in the first year of his administration, sex crime arrests increased by 85%. The discovery of non-normative sexual practices and gender expression by law enforcement in Los Angeles actually consolidated in the late 1930s. And then, so what we're seeing in this moment is actually just a re-intensification of a strategy that was used in an earlier time period. Um, the black invert as one iteration of the sexual criminal served not only to discipline all, uh, all women workers, especially those reluctant to like adhere to certain gendered norms after World War II, but also worked to devalue black domestic labor. The story of Tisha, Mary, and Rita is meant to act as a monstrous manifestation of the potential of interracial contact and underscore the always already lurking sexual and gender deviance of black laborers. Black trans reproductive labor in this is instance then is about the work that ungendering does to assert the inherent transpositionality of black gender in order to reproduce the racial and gendered social relations of the post-war labor market. 
By 1930, 87% of black women and 40% of black men worked as household servants, Josh Sides writes about. Um, black trans reproductive labor is also pointing to, oh, sorry, I don't know, that sentence was out of place, sorry, ignore that. Black trans reproductive labor is also pointing to an, epi an epistemological issue in terms of how we think about doing trans history and trans studies. This story was printed two years before the famous December 1952 New York Daily News article about Christine Jorgensen's sexual reassignment surgery titled, quote, XGI becomes blonde beauty, end quote in a similar vein to the way that media around Caitlyn Jenner has also cathected anxieties about the fungibility and potential of American white masculinity. Um, articles like this in Los Angeles and nationally exemplify the reorganization of post-war meanings of gender and sexuality. While Jorgensen's story opens up the space for the potential of a, of a kind of white trans life, Tisha, Mary, and Rita remind us that racist policing and the racialization of space are facilitating the elaboration of uh, anti-queer and trans containment strategies. While there, was a na while there was nascent gay political organizing against vice policing in this time period in Los Angeles, and I'm thinking of a group called the Coalition, the Citizens, it was called the Citizens Commission to Outlaw Entrapment, and that group was started by Harry Hay, and for a while was actually trying to work collaboratively with the Civil Rights Congress and try to think and theorize homophobic <coughs> policing as like an outgrowth of racist policing tactics, and they were trying to make those connections. Um, Emily Hobson writes about this in her work where they're actually trying to make those connections in terms of how they were politicizing vice policing, but, wait. <laughs> The varying tactics of the LAPD's uh, kind of articulations of queer criminality disappeared masquerading from the purview of gay activists. And so this is really important. So one of the things, one of the, one of the laws that was used most often to criminalize uh, especially white gay men was lewd vagrancy. That was the statute, it was called lewd vagrancy. But masquerading was masquerading was like a kind of an ad hoc municipal code and so therefore like the police didn't keep any data on the number of masquerading arrests they made so it was something that was like uh, this kind of flexible strategy of criminalization that could be deployed on different people and kind of disappear them as subjects of the law and so I think this is important because the way that the LAPD tabulated and kept records of sex work and sex crimes, I think actually ends up shaping how activists respond and articulate what is like homophobic policing, like what is what are the kind of gender and sexual politics of vice policing that they're trying to critique. And the way that, the, the way that, I'm not saying this is the only reason, but this is one of the contributing factors, like the way that the LAPD kind of chooses what to show and what not to show really obscured masquerading as something that has, ha like masquerading and uh, as I'll talk about a little bit early, this kind of what I will call a national effort to like de-wage or unwage drag performance. It doesn't understand that that's, that's the kind of racialized queer criminality tactic that's like literally prepping the ground for then what gets narrated as anti-homophobic policing in the 60s and 70s. And so part of how that, be, that is occluded from activists who weren't like stupid, like they went to, they were like, well, we wanna see the record, you know, like part of the, w the reason they couldn't see that is because how the, how the state's kind of data politics and data body politics, you know, ended up shaping what they under, what they could see and what they were gonna politicize. Okay, how much time do I have left? Okay, I gotta. Okay, I gotta go fast. Okay. Uh, the diversity of tactics that compose queer criminality abstracted the ways that the racialization of space formed the template for the exercise and practice of queer criminality, even for activists who are willing to see it, like these activists working in the c c uh, Citizens uh, Committee to Outlaw Entrapment. The insight that the racialization of space is informing, and sorry, this is an important thing too. The wh why does that work discontinue? Because of the rising tide of anti-communism. So like all the communist members of the Citizens Committee to Outlaw Entrapment, which was like an outgrowth of the Mattachine Society, very soon after, 
like in this time period get kicked out of the organization. And so then that connection to the CRC disappears. And so now they're not thinking as expansively as they could about the connections between like the racialization of space and then how queer criminality is being articulated in the moment. Um, the, the insight that the racialization of space is informing you, uh, post-war US articulations of queer criminality is not new, but remains an important thing to be reminded of. Uh, Marlon Ross, Margot Kennedy, Kevin Mumford, uh, Claire Sears and Christina, well, Claire Sears, different time period, but Christina Hanhart, for sure, all demonstrate this in their work. Uh, in Los Angeles, the criminalization of gender and sexual deviance developed as a part of the transition from a war on labor that was vital to the growth and development of the city's infrastructure to a war on crime which linked urbanization to a sharp decline in social values. Containing gender and sexual deviance was taken up by the LAPD as one avenue of boosting its own organizational capacity and autonomy during a drastic period of uh, political and cultural change in Los Angeles's, in Los Angeles's history. In 1938, Los Angeles Mayor Frank Shaw was the first mayor of a large U.S. city to be recalled. Uh, the campaign to recall him united progressive reformers uh, organized and organized labor against the issues of uncontrolled vice and police corruption, which Shaw embodied. The campaign against Shaw came to a head publicly when civic investigator Harry Raymond was almost killed in a car bombing orchestrated by an LAPD officer. The investigation of, and trial of Kynette focused public attention on the LAPD and bolstered support for this reform and recall movement, which successfully unseated Shaw and elected reformer Mayor Fletcher Bowen. Under Shaw, then Los Angeles Police Department Chief James Davis molded the LAPD into a more lethal force. Davis founded the police academy built by Central City Prisoner Labor, where he emphasized increased use of firepower and refinement in mark marksmanship for sworn officers. David is also the first police chief in the U.S. to employ the dragnet, a precursor to the br broken window style of policing that would characterize the Parker administration. Davis deployed professionalizing, the professionalizing LAPD primarily towards the suppression of radicalism and organized labor, as well as towards containing vagrancy. Under Davis's leadership and with the fiscal support of the Merchants and Manufacturers Association and the Better, Better America Federation, William Hines expanded the surveillance and cajoling work of the LAPD's Red Squad, infiltrating and weakening labor unions like the IWW. In 1936, Davis, fed up with the influx of so-called Okies to Los Angeles, expanded the jurisdiction of the LAPD by patrolling the California state borders to prevent poor people from in in entering Los Angeles. Like, they actually did this. And they had to get a court order to be like, You're, you can't patrol the state border of California. You're a Los Angeles Police Department officer. Anyway, uh, Davis assured elites that the blockade would save the city $1.5 million in property damages and $3 million in welfare payments. The blockades were ruled unconstitutional and ceased by court order after two months, though. However, Davis continued these tactics within the city limits for several years. The dragnet and ag aggressive policing tactics Davis developed to contain radicalism, organized labor, and poverty would, would soon be turned on a new security threat, the sexual criminal. So in 1938, in the midst of the mounting dissatisfaction with Shaw and the LAPD, Chief Davis established a Sex Offenses Bureau dedicated to studying the sexual criminal. The Los Angeles Times report on the establishment of the Bureau reads, quote, on the theory that each minor sex offender is a potential major sex criminal, Chief Davis yesterday established a Bureau of Sex Offenses for the classification and control of this type of crime. Davis then goes on to outline the responsibilities of the Bureau to maintain a database of sex offenders with fingerprints and photos and to facilitate the psychiatric examination of all sex offenders in order to determine, quote, the proper correctional as well as punitive procedure for their rehabilitation, end quote. Davis also notes that the Bureau would be responsible for creating a classification system that would help law enforcement create profiling systems to identify future sex deviants. Containing queer criminality emerged in Los Angeles as a site of struggle between progressive labor coalition and the Shaw camp and was supported by the data and intelligence gathering imperative that underscored the LAPD's war on organized labor. On one hand, selective enforcement of vice satisfied the needs of the mayor who had tied to, or who had tied to organized vice. This fact was well known and publicized by the uh, by 
the civic-led coalition who used the unchecked spread of vice as a rallying call against corruption. In response, the LAPD began to turn its attention increasingly towards black women, sex workers, and gender impersonators working in so-called pansy clubs as social ills that required police containment and intervention. That same year, the LAPD also hired famed criminal profile and author of The Sexual Criminal, John Paul DeRiver, to run the Sex Crimes Bureau. DeRiver worked as a consultant for the LAPD, helping to solve several high-profile murder cases, training LAPD officers in criminal profiling and educating a curious public about the, quote, sexual criminal. Vice had long been a source of LAPD power and profit from the founding of the force, and containing so-called sex perverts emerged as a political strategy to appease an increasingly concerned middle class that was organized across racial lines, while they continued to let particular commercial vice establishments flourish. This appears to be a pattern, th yeah, sorry. Archival work done by myself and so yeah, one of the things, th this has been a point of departure for me to think about uh, with my students. So one of the things I'm working on with my students in the carceral geographies class is we're creating a database of, inspired by like the way Stuart Hall counted stories of mugging for policing the crisis. We're creating a database of like uh, historical reporting about the criminalization of gender nonconformity in terms of like police interaction, uh, like labor, you know, if people are getting fired from jobs, anything that was reported to understand if there's any sort of temporality or like regional specificity to the, the articulation of gender uh, and criminalization of gender nonconformity across the 20th century. And so one thing that doing this work with my students kind of underscores is that we see, so this is definitely happening in LA. Daniel Hurowitz in his book, Bohemian Los Angeles, writes about this kind of uh, incursion upon pansy clubs. But actually what doing this research with my students emphasized for me is that actually this is something we see happening in a lot of cities like in these exact years, like starting in 1937, 38, and going into throughout the 40s in cities like Baltimore, Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles, Har New York, Harlem, where you see like police are routinely ra raiding so-called pansy clubs where often people who people who made a living performing drag would work, but also people who live their everyday lives as gender nonconforming, like, you know, I don't know, it's hard, I'm trying not to impose our today's terms on people from the past, it's hard, but people who are kind of, you know, gender and sexually nonconforming in their everyday life would also work and frequent these places. So it was meant to, I like to think, I'm trying to think about what it means to think about this as an actual national campaign to like de-wage and unwage this form of labor that had all ha, that had grown as a kind of like evidence of the fact that racial capitalism actually works as an ungendering force. It, it's, it creates multiplying discourses of gender and sexuality and then the spatialities that arise to kind of like create new vectors and avenues for the so-called reproduction of the workforce and the productivity <laughs> of the workforce. So like, so anyway, that was like, that was a major tangent. How much time do I have left? <laughs> okay, I'll, let me try to move on. So yeah, I just wanna underscore, it's noteworthy that knowledge about and containment of queer criminality and the LAPD crackdown on gender impersonation, performances, drag balls, sex work, and bathhouses, which increases after 1938, emerges in this, in this uh, political context, heralding the shift in policing priorities from containing labor towards containing crime, which we know is just like an abstracted war on labor. Um, the transition from a war on labor to a war on crime was a scale-making project that helped liberal reformers, labor organizers, commercial vice operations, and city politicians imagine how policing could succeed in maintaining order in Los Angeles. While containing queer criminality created an opportunity to resolve a conflict over who controls the police, a reform agenda created the opportunity for the LAPD to, to successfully vie for increased organizational autonomy. And I don't, we can come back to that. I don't have time to tell the story because I want to move on to the next story. I can leave this up if people want to look at it later. These are some maps I made that were just trying to actually make, to make these connections to be like, okay, I found these stories, but then the archive runs cold. So where do I turn to next to try to like make the point? So what I got, one of the, like 
that story of these three young people was one of the first things I encountered in the archive. And I was like, this is like, this is what I want to talk about. And I was like, but I can't find any more stuff about these people. But the biggest insight I got from that was seeing how racial profiling kind of just formed the unnamed scene of encounter that allows that facilitated this like discovery of gender inversion and that even allows us in the present to look back on this and reclaim it as like a kind of scene of the production of trans subjects. And so that insight was really pushing me to think about, okay, so how does the racial how does the racialization of space form the kind of productive template for the un, the articulation of queer criminality? And so sorry, it's not like super visible. But so I made these maps, like I found all the sex work and sex crime data, and I like drew the policing districts from the 50s and 60s to actually see like where were they making the most arrests. And what I find interesting is that, and something I talk about in like the, the longer version of this already long work is how even though like gay police reform agenda starts to kind of circulate around Hollywood as like claiming that space as gay LA, um, for this entire duration, the majority of arrests were being made in the central district always, always, like always in downtown, in this neighborhood that, in this kind of stretch of space that up until Shelley versus Kramer, I think something like 90% of non-white people were kind of like, who lived in Los Angeles were like corralled into this area. And so, yeah, I was just really trying to like make that point given that there are certain things I wanted to find in the archive that I couldn't find. Um, and this is just more of that information from the police archive. And then, huh, I'm running out of time. So yeah, th there are like so much explaining. So this story is about Sir Lady Java. Uh, this is a photo on the left is of Sir Lady Java. Uh, Sir Lady Java is still alive. She's 75 years old. And in 1967, she was the most popular drag performer in LA. She also like lived her everyday life as a woman. Um, she grew up in Louisiana and like, her family moved to LA as a part of the Great Migration. And she, I think, um, yeah, I don't have time, yeah, I just don't have time to, to do like the reading that I wanna do, but this story is about how, so as Sir Lady Java gains popularity, uh, the LAPD starts harassing her, they send plainclothes officers to her show, they start surveilling her. And so there's this one bar that she performs at called the Red Fox that was owned by Red Fox from Stanford and Sons. That was like this black owned bar on the west side that you know Studio Watts used for fundraisers sometimes. So they targeted her at this bar, what I which I think was also about Red Fox, like being a black like being a black bar owner on the west side and like kind of having these connections to the parts of LA that people don't want to imagine in the west side. So. Uh, she's going to work there, and this document on the right here is a notice that was sent to Red Fox by the Los Angeles Police Commission. So up until, I think it was like 1969, the Los Angeles Police Commission had a rule where you could not, it was illegal to perform, to employ someone who was per, uh, performing as a member of the opposite gender. That's what the rule, the letter of the rule said without a written permit from the LA police commissioner. So I've like read a decade of LA police commission meeting minutes to see if in fact they ever like gave out one single permit and I don't think that they did. Um, but so they sent this letter, uh, police officers actually came to the Red Fox. Uh, Red Fox ignored them and had Java perform anyway. And the, the kind of threat was we approve your liquor license. So if you don't stop employing this pers person, we'll pull your business permit. And I think this is also interesting in the way that like, again, we see these this push to kind of contain gender nonconformity and specifically black gender nonconformity. Um, dang, I totally lost. Oh yeah, like make target people, but disappear them as subjects of the law. So Java is not playing, she has a protest, she finds the ACLU and she's like, I'm gonna sue the LA Police Commission because they are messing with my money and my ability to reproduce myself. <laughs> um, and I think to me, like this kind of points towards, I, I don't have time to talk about it all. Um, but anyway, yeah, so this was the second story I was gonna share and then the third uh, was a story about Laverne Turner, 
who is a 20 year old black gender nonconforming person who's murdered by the LAPD in 1970. And I kind of talk about how in the process of trying to memorialize Turner, uh, gay activists like repeatedly like ungender and regender Turner in order to kind of like suture the politics of suffering that can like cohere a uh, gay liberal police reform institutionality. And so that's a part, so in, in each of these three instances, I'm trying to kind of work through these archives to get at and think about like what is black trans reproductive labor and then I can go back to that little summary slide there and I can take questions now. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, this is really important. I'm really grateful about this. I told my, I saw my dad yesterday. He came to see me and saved me from midterms, and my dad grew up in South Los Angeles. And I was telling him about this mapping project. He was like, oh, you should send me that. And I was like, I can't believe you want me to send you stuff about queerness, but okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I think, I don't know if Professor Harper is still, she is still here. So she's been completely messing me up talking about a positionality and like I'm trying to like come. I'm trying to think about like this idea of like, these like critical black geographers that I'm, you know, pushing in that too with this mapping project, um, in terms of like sort of like locating these like instances where the, I guess you could say like the exact same thing that like people like you mentioned about Ferguson when you're talking about like, the convergence of like sexuality policing and gender policing and like racial policing, um, in the context of like like all of this has like a spatiality to it. And something that I've been like working on like uh, through time is like um, carceral, like the expansion of the carceral state outside of the, the U.S. borders and, and these sort of like no man places. When I see this, I immediately think of like Guantanamo, like the fact that like you know when like Guantanamo was like used to detain like Haitian folks, and the first thing they would do was like, oh, you probably have AIDS, so like let me test you. So like how. It's like spatiality has to has a big deal with it, but also like how do you talk about black spatiality in places that aren't necessarily like that you can't necessarily map out in the same way? Because um, I think the, there's a, there's a lot of ability, there's a lot of capabilities within mapping, but I don't know if I'm making any sense. There's like a lot of like potential in mapping things, but like there's also a lot of obscurity and and I guess like these regimes. So I don't know, like, I'm just trying to think of like the best way that you, like, because I see you using the archive against what these like established war, like it was for like crime um, data collection, but like how do you situate that? Like how do you, how do you situate it in a place that's like not as state specific? I don't know if that's making any sense. I don't know how to. Did you want to take a second and yeah. Yeah. Um, so you talk you first talked about a positionality. Yeah. And that that was the thing. But then we got away from that. So I guess I was just asking what about yeah, like can we go back to a because a positionality and like how that is shaping this question? Like what is it about? Because this is like locating like this is locating it in Los Angeles, like that's a specific place like you can look at a map of Los Angeles but it's not like you can access like oh like this is you know there's like sort of these places that aren't located within the United States or within specific countries so like they're sort of in these like weird places where they're situated in multiple like national um, contexts yeah. context. so I was like how that you can't apply the same you can apply similar things to it but like I don't know I mean, just confuse myself too. <laughs> no, I think I see what you're like. I see what you're saying. Like, how do you, t how would you talk about like, how would you talk about a, like maybe black, trans or queer geography that isn't so like spatially right. contained in the city, yeah. of Los Angeles, without ha so I guess. This is a good question and something I'm wrestling with because to me like. I'm trying to gesture at this thing that for me is ultimately actually like almost unassimilable to a code. So it's almost like a creative exercise <laughs> that I'm engaging in here to be like, let's look at, and then uh, I can send you the link, but in the like, <coughs> I have an online version of those maps where I'm 
trying to look at, I'm trying to think about things as layering. So it's like not about trying to prove or like locate, so, like pinpoint, like this is, what, but it's actually try, like taking some of these stories and figuring out where they happen and then layering things like the 1935 Homeowners and Loan Corporation residential security maps and layering that with this policing data. Because I think like we learn from someone like Khalil Gibran Muhammad is like we have to be skeptical of the police archive. Like who knows if these were the arrests that they were making. But I think the recreating these statistics and map form is interesting because it provides a view of like the LAPD's queer <coughs> containment spatial imaginary. Like this is what they sold to people as this is where we're arresting people and this is what it looks like to do our job. So to me mapping is like, mapping is me trying to have like a critical engagement with something like GIS and digital humanities uh, that I think often is really confounding for people who are trying to talk about black geographies because Catherine McKittrick writes that they often like defy or confound cartographic representation. So I wouldn't like argue that those maps are a cartographic representation of the like black trans geography that I'm trying to suture or gesture to in the speech. I think it's just a glimpse of like the police's discourse of queer criminality and how that actually was in a, a spatial imaginary and trying to actually map it on to space. Yeah. Does that sort of begin to answer I your question? I think that's what's going on. I had um, two questions. And one is, um, is there very basic question mm -hmm. but it's a hard one. And that is um, particularly because queer criminality comes into view in this domain racialized space, how do you actually parse the difference between criminalizing queerness and criminalizing blackness? Mm -hmm. So to me, this is where I'm like move, this is what trans reproductive labor is trying to think about, I guess for me is like, I'm really trying to think about like following Preciado's kind of push to be like, gen like gender as we know it today is kind of like a Cold War invention. It's like, well maybe gender as we know it today and especially in this moment, right, where like, you know, the liberal, like liberals in Los Angeles were totally about trying to talk about gender identity versus sex, particularly to like, because of their sentimentality around certain white trans figures. But I'm trying to think about, does trans reproductive labor point us to the, fa to the fact that we should think about gender as like, the strategy through which like racial difference is like reaches some of its most abstracted elaboration. And so for me, I'm not in, like I'm not interested in parsing, but I am interested then in how it gets parsed by activists, like how the difference actually gets parsed and it's actually like the black gender nonconforming figure who literally like this person becomes a figure of articulating like the difference between actually. I have a okay. follow-up question. It was um, the Preciado's point. And he said two things. He said, one, racial capitalism is on gender. And you also said gender snaps into place, or that the domestic comes into view in this cold war moment. And I want you to uh, explain that. I guess not comes into view. I'm thinking like, because sometimes when we talk about this moment, it's like, oh, these retrograde gender like these retrograde gender <coughs> notions were being put, like pushed back on to people because the post-war, like the wartime labor economies needed to violate these, like this gendered division of labor. And I guess like this is probably like, you, got, you like, you're like right at like, I don't know, what is it like, you know, like the fontanelle of a baby, like the part of my head that's not fully <laughs> formed yet. Like you're like right there. Um, <laughs> Cause like this is what I'm this is what I'm trying to like really work out. But like yeah, thank you for bringing it to the fontanelle. Um, thank you so much for coming here and talking. It's amazing, and I can honestly listen to you talk for hours. And it's just fantastic. Anyway, um, so I have a question in terms of your research and also uh, like the database you were talking about with your students of informing that. And you did mention throughout your talk that it's difficult to find um, these cases, and then when you do find it, these these cases of people who are arrested for being transforming or whatever the case was, because some of them are get lost or they're not reported. So then how do you account for that factor of 
it not being there or when they reported or it was labeled as masquerading or not? How do you account for that variable in your research? And that? I don't think it's a variable I try, I'm try. i trying to account for. I think it's a variability that I'm trying to theorize. Like, so, I, yeah, I don't, if that's, the, if that's the, the shortest answer I could give to the question. Heather, thank you so much um, for your talk. And in a way, I just want to give you an opportunity to say more about Laverne Turner, who seems really different from your other cases and who appears in the record only as a dead body, you know, not as somebody living who's arrested and is, I presume, a, a gender non-conforming, queer, masculine person, is that right? Is, is well, that's what, that's, that's, that's yeah. right? Right. So <laughs> what, <laughs> but what about this archive that uh, can hold on to figures who pass through the law, but then there are all of these transmasculine folks who are not performing for money or not for money on stages, or maybe they are, and maybe some of those people appear in your record, like as Stormy Delavari did in New York City, also from New Orleans, also around this time. And then does any of this change when Catch One comes into being in 1972, and there's suddenly a venue, I don't know, maybe you know yeah. other places where... I mean, I'm really struggling, and th yeah, thank you, also Fontanelle. Um, Cause right, that's like the present absence of the archive, like trans, a trans masculine geography. And it's because, right, like there's something about the way that this archive is made possible through the law and then what things, what things seem meaningful to gay activists. And so, yeah, to me, like the ungeography of black trans masculinity like that's, yeah, like that's what I'm digging through the archive for and just trying to figure out like, how do I read that or how, like what are ways to read and approximate that in its absence, knowing that, especially for trans masculine people, right? Like in terms of queer criminality, like you could be arrested for masquerading, you could be arrested for prostitution or sex work, you could be arrested for, and I think it's that, like I, I don't have an antidote to that, I'm just trying to sit with it and think about what it means and then what that means in our present day in terms of the way that, like thinking about the way that uh, Aren Ozora writes about trans value, like mm -hmm. thinking about how that plays out in the present day with someone, for example, like the case of Kai Peterson, who's a black trans masculine person, right? Who even in this moment where like supporting black trans people is like, you know, can be such an act of liberal virtue signaling. Like no one cares about Kai's case because Kai's not a trans femme. Like there, it's not sutured into this like narrative of like producing particularly gay male space that's super durable and endures today. And I think, yeah, so thank you for, thank you for asking that question because I think I'm trying to also think about trans, yeah, like trans reproductive labor and what this kind of present absence of a trans masculine geography really means, yeah. Engaging with the archive, I imagine that we're encountering institutional systemic evaluation of certain kinds of narratives. How do you engage with that in um, searching for first person narratives of those who are systematically um, devalued within our society? How do I, sorry, I just have um, How do you, how, have you found it incredibly difficult to find uh, first person narratives um, from folks who are systematically devalued within <coughs> our social framework? Um, first person narratives, yeah, well, so that's why I was like so annoyed that I didn't get to really read through the Sir Lady Java story, because I actually, uh, me and, C. Jerome Woods, who started this amazing project called the Black LGBT Project, that he is a gay retired school teacher and he's just been collecting ephemera throughout his life. Mm -hmm. So he has an archive in his house. Uh, he actually helped me find Sir Lady Java and we interviewed her. So there's like, that's why I, I wanted to read like her first person account of like why she did what she did. And because I just love how she frames it, you know, like there's this article called MTF activism in the tenderloin that like recover, recovers Sir Lady Java as like MTF. And I met her and the first thing she said to me is like, baby, what's trans? Like, that's what they're, call <laughs> that's what they're calling us now. Like, what is that? I'm a woman. And she framed like 
throughout this inter, I mean, she's like 74, she survived a stroke, but she remembers everything and she framed what she was doing as a, like as an employment, like a racist labor issue, like that's what it was for her. And I was like, but did some of these like homophile organizations approach you? And she was like, oh, you know, like they weren't studying us. And by us, she means like her and other black gender non-conforming trans femmes. Um, and what's interesting too in this archive, we see that like black, um, you know, like sometimes the way that we talk about black labor for me gets really stale. It was like black men did this. And you see in this archive, like the violation of all those bounds. So Laverne Turner was a dishonorably discharged naval service person who worked at an aerospace firm in Los Angeles. Sir Lady Java bought her whole family who migrated from Louisiana a house with the money that she made from being like the most famous drag queen in LA. So part of what I want to do in thinking about this is like, how is the kind of like, why, like, why would we take it for granted? I read so many reports that take it for granted that like trans people, especially black trans people are under and unemployed. It's almost just like a neglected fact. And part of my work is trying to understand like, how did that happen? Because we have all these counter narratives where it's like, sir, now Sir Lady Java is struggling because like she didn't, there's no pension plan for being the most famous drag queen in Los Angeles, but which there should, there totally should be. <laughs> um, but yeah, like now she's struggling financially, but like, you know, she lived like, I won't say she lived a middle class lifestyle, but she lived uh, definitely beyond what was imagined for someone like her in her time. So just thinking about, and that goes back to thinking about how Aren is talking about trans value and trans valuation and like what if we try to actually understand interest in gender nonconformity even when it's not rendered through the terminology of trans as something that's iterative and related to crises and racial capitalism. Um, I was just wondering, or I just wanted you to clarify, I know you had a map up there, sorry, but um, I was just wondering, like the first, one of the first cases you showed, you showed was the three trans black folks in the it wasn't just white, it was actually like really mixed. Mm -hmm. So the north side was super rich and white, the south side was less so. And actually, sorry, I keep talking, I'm going to pull up something. I was just curious, like, because that's around the time my family moved to LA, I was just wondering how different, because LA is very like rooted to different, like, it's not very spread out. So I was just wondering how the different areas, I think that's an interesting question. I definitely think like, at least in the work I've been doing a lot around Los Angeles, actually this whole project started out as a collaborative project with Jerome where he was like, Trevor, I want to understand, I want to understand what was happening with black queer people in the 30s and 40s, and I was like, okay, Jerome, I'll try, like, I'll try to understand that. I'll try, to, I'll try to see. So like what that, I'm trying to pull up this map I made, but at least what I found is like, I think it's, I think it's varying, right? Like maybe if you paid off the police, you were not like visible to the, like you were visible to the LAPD, but they weren't gonna rent like this whole kind of production. Like I feel it was very strategic, like which places got targeted. And there's definitely stories that actually, to me, a lot of the stories that you find are really like clustered, spatially clustered in the central district and in Wilshire. And then there's this whole like kind of I found out that there's this Elks Lodge in South LA that used to be like the frequent spot of a lot of drag balls and was like a space that was used over and over and that's like an inter that's an interesting connection. So yeah, that's a really good question. Like are people more or less visible like in in black neighborhoods versus like moving into white space and I like I don't know, in some cases we see yes, and then in some cases, right? Like Sir Lady Java, I feel like would be the yes. Like she becomes hyper visible only when she starts getting popular and she's about to perform at this like black owned bar that's kind of like out of place. Like it's not where it should be. Um, but I think for me, what was more interesting in that in all these cases is that the way that we get to like have any sort of glimpse of these figures is kind of an arc, like a kind of, 
necropolitical archive of police violence. And I think that's, I don't know, that's telling. And I was trying to think about how to tell a story about that that doesn't kind of redouble down on like black abjection or try to like renaturalize it. So let's give Jamal a